This is Kevin Donahue with ProTivity, welcoming you to a new edition of Powerful Insights. On our recent live global webinar, Lindsay Dart, Managing Director of ProTivity UK, and David Thomas, Vice President of ProTivity UK Managed Services, had a great chat with ProTivity Brand Ambassador and PGA Tour member Matt Fitzpatrick. Matt, a British golfer who just completed his first season on the tour, did exceptionally well qualifying for the FedEx Cup playoffs and also advanced to the BMW Championship. His record for the year included five top tens, and he impressively made the cut in 12 of his 15 starts. In this conversation, Matt talks about his game, being a professional athlete during our lockdown, how he prepares for various tournaments, advice for amateur golfers, and why he decided to become a brand ambassador for ProTivity. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to our first Q&A session with ProTivity brand ambassador, Matt Fitzpatrick. So uh, those of you who don't know me, my name is Lindsay Dart. I'm one of the managing directors at ProTivity based in the UK. I gave Matt a, sh a shock earlier when he discovered that the girl he was expecting wasn't, and in fact, is a 59-year-old bloke who's also, uh, in my spare time, a complete hacker around a golf course. Um, <laughs> for those of you not familiar with Prativity, uh, we're a global consulting firm. We deliver deep expertise, objective insights, and a tailored approach and parallel collaboration to help business leaders face the future with confidence. We were delighted um, earlier this year when Matt joined us and he wears our logo on his left sleeve. Well positioned, Matt. There you go. There you um, go. Thank you. And he joins. He joined a, a fellow golfer, Jennifer Kupcho, as a brand ambassador for us, uh, representing our values of innovation, inclusion and integrity. I'm pleased uh, to be joined as MC today by my colleague Dave Thomas. Uh, I have to confess, uh, Matt, that I promised Dave that I wouldn't mention he's actually a professional golfer as well. Um, I think oh, formerly yes. on the Euro Pro Tour, is that right, in the European Tour, Dave? Played, uh, uh, played Challenge Tour uh, 2010 to 2012. Oh, okay, nice. But he's now found his true calling with Prativity, and he leads our ah, um, services business in Wales and the <laughs> southwest. So, Matt, if it all goes horribly wrong in the future, you can always come to point. <laughs> I can come to productivity. There you go. Exactly. Yeah, I, I like it. I like it. <laughs> so, um, I'm sure you're all aware Matt plays on both the PGA and the European golf tours. He won the uh, US Amateur in 2013 and has five career victories as a professional. Um, and I think you beat Nick Faldo's record for youngest player to get uh, five victories on the European tour. So congratulations. Yeah. Thank He's you. currently Thank ranked you. 20th in the world. And we're speaking to him um, ahead of the Scottish Open, which is being held at the Renaissance Club in North Berwick this week. And then next week at the PGA Championship at Wentworth in Surrey. So Matt, thanks very much for joining us today. No, not all. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, Matt, a rather unusual year for all of us. Um, and Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah, professional golf, no different. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did during during lockdown? Uh, not a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, not a lot. Um, for me, I came home from the Players' Championship on the, uh, the Monday. I think I flew home the Monday after the Players'. Um, and then, yeah, we were. I was basically home for about four days, um, where all tournaments were cancelled. E everything was done, basically. Um, and then um, home for about four days, and then UK officially went into full full lockdown. Um, so then it was like, right, what what do I do from from here, really? So. Um, I managed to get a net to hit into in the back garden. Uh, I already had a mat, balls, clubs, obviously, but um, got that set up and, and uh, away I went. And for the first two weeks, it was great because it was new. It was like a novelty, you know, it was new hitting 
hitting shots into a net. And then uh, after about two weeks, it, it, I got fed up. Um, and uh, even though it was only, you know, 10 yards away to my back garden to hit balls, I, I sometimes I couldn't bring myself to do it, I, you know. I was seeing the ball fly two yards. Uh, I didn't know anything really. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it was very, very strange. So from your point of view, what was the best bit about quarantine? Was there, the, were there the any positives? About, the best bit about quarantine was, um, you know, not having to not having to go out and travel, to be honest. <laughs> After doing it for like the five, last five years, um, I don't get me wrong, I absolutely love it, but you know, it was it was actually a nice break to just not have to go to an airport and um and everything like that. It was kind of kind of a nice reset to be honest. Um just to sort of you know, it was it's I feel like I well, I know I'm very, very lucky as to, to do what I do, but to uh to sort of have a reset in this way was uh was obviously not ideal, but um at the same time it, it wasn't you know, I didn't feel like it was the end of the world really, so and how much time do you how much time do you spend on away from home on on tour? In a, in a um, I mean, I think I probably play about thirty twenty seven no probably about twenty seven to thirty weeks a year. Um, and this year, obviously, a few quite a few less just because of you know tournaments from through lockdown or cancelled and not not sort of reorganised. So um, I'll, I'll be away for 30 weeks a year playing tournaments and then, you know, just a few extra weeks, probably three, three, four extra weeks away, um, just either from travelling or various other bits and bobs, really. So Yeah, yeah. So you, I think you returned to the PGA Tour in the middle of June. So yes. what's it been like? What's it been like back on tour? And um, it's been strange. Yeah, I mean, obviously having no fans, it's um, very unusual. Uh, you know, there's no atmosphere at tournaments. It's you make a putt of thirty feet, and it's a little bit flat. Uh, so it, it has been very strange. But at the same time, you know, it, it's just been great to get back playing again. Um, this is actually my first week uh, back on the European tour since January, because um, mainly I've been playing in the States. So the setup here is a little bit different. It's a little bit um, stricter in terms of the, what, what we can and can't do. I mean, I'm fortunate enough to stay on site this week. So, um, you know, I can just, I don't have to move. It's hotel golf course anyway, but there's some people staying in Edinburgh, 45 minutes away, and, and they, you know, once they get to the hotel, they can't leave. So, um, yeah, it's uh, it's not uh, not ideal. Yeah, because I think during the UK swing, there were quite a, there were some really struggled with it. There was, yeah, yeah, and and it's, I mean, it is understandable. Uh, I I do get it. Um, from from my side, you know. I'm not trying to be rude to those people, but you know, I don't have I'm, I don't have a family yet. I'm still pretty young, but um, I think you know you kind of know what you signed up for, you know, when, once you once you enter. Um, so I, I don't know. I feel like you know the the guys knew sort of what they were what they were getting into really, but uh, I, I can understand that it's it's very very strange um, not being able to leave the hotel room for week after week after week. Yeah. And do you think it's changed the result, not having crowds? I mean, do you think? Uh, I think, yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't put a finger on what it's done exactly, but um, I think it's, I think some events it's gone one or two, one of two ways, really. It's either people have felt more comfortable, so the scores are a lot lower, it's a little bit more relaxed, or... Um, it's kind of the, the the other way almost that they're not getting sort of the energy off the crowd and not not playing as well and um and I think that's that's you know that's also something that's happened I think at the tour. Matt, we've got a, we've got a question here uh, and a link to that in terms of feeling uh, more or less pressure uh, without the fans there. Uh, I know a couple of the boys that play and, and they really miss it and they need it to feed off it to your point with the energy but 
What, what about you? Have you felt more or less pressure without the fans there? No, I, I mean, honestly, I wouldn't say I've noticed it. I mean, no, that's a lie. I've noticed that there's no fans, obviously, but um, in terms of you know pressure performing, I wouldn't say I've uh, I've noticed it too much. You know, I'm still you're still sort of focused on every shot, and and there's a, there's a lot to be said for that. But for, for me, you know, I would always rather play in front of crowds. Um, just to have an atmosphere, just to, to, just to, you know, to get excited about something. Um, the, the, the TV, the, the foot, the crowd noise for the football is, is just awful. I hate it. And then, you know, I like listening to, to it quiet, but at the same time, then it just sounds, it does sound very weird. Um, but, Absolutely. you know, for me, the sooner we can get crowds back in, into everything, the, the better it'd be, um, you know, once, particularly once golf comes back, once football comes back, it, that those first few events and games are going to be unbelievable. I mean, there have to be some benefits. And, and, and during... not shouting, get in the hole, though, isn't it? Well, yeah, that's that's polite. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that, makes it, uh, that's, uh, that makes it a lot easier. I know, for one, my caddy, Billy Foster, he's delighted about that. He was uh, getting fed up about that. Uh, I mean, that only happened... <laughs> That only happened. I don't know if there's many Americans on this call, but that mainly happened. No, in you're America. in safe. You're in safe territory. You're, we're, we're, <laughs> this is the European. <laughs> so you haven't you haven't heard many mashed potatoes kicking around then, Matt? Have you? Not not in Scotland. Not in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Did um, I was, I was, we've got a couple of questions in the chat and. Uh, we're going to, we're going, we'll, I'm sure, come on to uh, the, the Bryson uh, Deschambeau bulk uh, topic. Um, yeah, but one question that, that I did have: Did you take, did you take, um, did you take time during the lockdown to review any of your equipment? So conscious that you you have been using the old an older tailor made uh, driver. Um, clearly, you've got the, the ping iron setup, and then um, uh, and then I think it's the Seymour or the Yes Puller. Did you yeah. have you made any changes to that? Did you consider making no, any changes? No, no, nothing, nothing really. Um, I, I've not made it. Well, the only change I've made this year is a three wood. Uh, that yeah. was sort of on the edge of. We were getting rid of that anyway at the start of the season. We were kind of in and out of that anyway. Um, but uh, on the whole, my driver cracked a, a few weeks ago in in Chicago, but uh, fortunately, TaylorMade had some spares, so they sent me those. So, um, you know, the ones they sent me is exact copy, so no problems there. Um, but everything else has been changed. I'm not someone that, that likes to change too much, really. Um, it's interesting. I was having the same discussion with my trainer and my caddy today. Uh, my trainer was like, oh, you seem to crack, a, crack clubs all the time. And actually, I don't. I've cracked two in my entire life. So <laughs> they just happen to be in, in the last in the last 12 months. So, um, no, we, I, I don't like to change much. I think it's you're kind of risking it a little bit. You've got to have yeah. that comfort factor with the club that you're using. Uh, you've got to be confident in what it is, really. Surprised one of the manufacturers haven't uh, managed to snap you up to get the whole bag yet. I'm sure they're all queuing up. Uh, they've, they, uh, they, Taylor, Taylor may tried for a little bit, um, but but my my problem with TaylorMade is that I've only got one club of theirs, so it's it's hard to sort of get the whole set in. Um, the closest is Ping, and I love the Ping drivers, but this TaylorMade driver is is as good as I've ever 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 had. So it, it's just stupid to change. So I would say Ping are the closest, um, but um, yeah, I mean, what's uh, what's the saying if if it. Is it ain't it broke, don't fix it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Lindsay, over to you. Yeah, thanks. So, so Matt, um, I guess we, we, we had a couple of questions um, when people were registering around, when did you really first realise that you were, you could make it as a professional golfer? Um, and, and, and I guess just linked to that, how much support did you get from your parents in that? And, and, yeah, I mean, for me, the the plan was always to, well, I say always, from about 16, 17, um, start playing. I was playing for England and, you know, playing for county, playing well. Then I won the British boys and then I decided to go to university. And, and the plan really was to do four years, get a degree to fall back on in case golf didn't work out. You know, it was a great plan. 
And then 2013 came round and I was playing awful at the start of the year, then qualified for the Open. Um, won the low amateur at the Open, then won the US amateur, and all of a sudden all these doors opened and um, couldn't really afford to turn them down, you know, playing in PGA Tour events, playing in, you know, majors and stuff like that. So that, that changed my uh, opinion big time. Um, my dad... Um, my dad sort of sought the advice of Pete Cowan, whether he thought I was I was ready, um, and uh, and he thought I was. You know, he compared me to some players out here that he saw regularly, and he said, you know, he's he's comfortably good enough to compete, and and that was the thing really. It sort of came out um, after I turned pro, played okay on my starts, nothing special, and then sort of gradually got more comfortable out, out here, and and sort of ended up um yeah sort of establishing myself as a as a as a winner and stuff like that so um that was kind of the, the plan was never to turn pro you know from nine years old it was never always going to be a professional golfer it was always just to sort of work hard and and see see where it end, went really and, and take it from there and uh fortunately so far it's gone all right and you've always got Prativity as a backup anyway. So. Exactly. Now you told yeah. me. Yeah. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll tell Joe. Hey, man, it works. It too. works. It works. I'll tell, I'll tell Joe that. So that's fine. I'm sure he loves me. <laughs> Matt, we've got, a, we've got a question here uh, and, and quite an interesting one. Who was or is your golfing or sporting hero, uh, whether that be growing up or, or indeed now? Um, Growing up, I mean... Uh, I mean, everyone, it was always Tiger as, as a golfer, you know, it was always Tiger. And I, I don't think I probably idolized him as much as some others uh, did necessarily. And, and I wouldn't really necessarily said I had anyone um, that I really took after. And I was like, oh, I want to be like them. Or, I don't know. I don't, that just never was, was me really. I, I kind of wanted to sort of do my own thing and, 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 and be myself. I, I had, so much um respect and admiration for actually my my coaches um Pete Cowan and Mike Walker um and if anything like I you know I figured if I, if golf didn't work out I would you know try and work for them um uh, but sort of just growing up and and sort of working with them they were sort of two people I, I looked up to a lot particularly for advice and you know obviously getting my golf better too and then that was a that was a big deal for me. So Matt, great. And um, sorry, so go on, Lindsay. I'll, uh, I'll fire him with a few more questions shortly. So, so I think um, a couple of people have asked the same question, Matt. Thinking about your game and and strengths uh, and maybe areas for development. What courses suit your game best? Do you think? Um, for me, I would say that it's. I would say so tight tight golf course tree lined um that's the that's the courses i enjoy playing uh for one um it's interesting i mean I, for what i thought would suit my game i've played on golf courses and, and never played well around them um trying to give you an example dubai desert classic you know if you hit it offline there yeah you, you're, you're, you're not in great positions and yeah. um it, is you know that that's kind of my strength. I'm I'm kind of a straight player, and um, but I just never got on with it there. And and I think the I think that's probably because a lot of the hole, ninety percent of the holes are, are right to left, and I and I hit it the other way. So that that's not ideal. But then realised sort of the last two years, Abu Dhabi, when I first came out on tour and I was hitting it shorter, it it definitely didn't suit me. I wasn't long enough, and. And I came out this year and I was longer and the year before I played really well and, and I've had a second and a third there. So, um, you know, that all of a sudden becomes a golf course that you didn't think was going to suit you, but now it does. So Absolutely. Um, I think it, honestly it varies year on year and, and there's there's a lot of stats models that say, oh, this golf course suits you and this golf course might not. And, and I've been and, Absolutely. you know, I've been to them and, and sort of blow them blown them away. I mean, one prime example actually was this year, um, the golf course, the, tra the Travellers, TPC River Highlands. I'd never played it before. That was like, according to the stat people I work with, that was like the number one golf course to suit Matt Fitzpatrick's game. 
and I missed the cut. So it's just like, <laughs> it, it's like, well, okay, well, that's given me that. But, you know, it, it really does, it depends on how you play on the day. Um, and I can think of golf courses that are wide as hell and I've had good finishes on them. So I really think it, it kind of just depends, you know, it is like straight up, if you play well, it doesn't matter where you play, you know, you'll, you'll play yeah. well. Well, I suppose you can think about your win uh, up in the Swiss mountains, you know, on a you know, bunch of people that have won there previously have been absolute bombers and, yeah. and people like Miguel that have won around there, you know, a couple of those short par fours, nice and tight, got to plot your way around there. Um, exactly. So it shows it can uh, it can work on any um, exactly. on any stage. One one thing I did want to come on to, and you've mentioned about bombing it, and we talked about sort of getting big and hitting the longer. So you know we're we're going towards the Bryson bit, which is interesting. I'm sure everybody wants to know about that. But we've got a couple of questions here uh, in quite a similar vein from Steve and Caroline and a couple of others. Uh, have uh, young young children, uh, sons and daughters. Uh, ones. Uh, Steve has something called Jack's turning 10 tomorrow. He's about to go to his academy. Caroline's got a 14-year-old golf obsessed. What's the best piece of advice uh, you could potentially give them? My best piece of advice would be, uh, well, there's obviously a few bits, but I would say that they just got to keep enjoying it. Um, don't don't lose the enjoyment for it. Uh, it's, it's very easy to do that and sort of, but yeah, you, you you got to keep enjoying it. But at the same time, you know, if you want to make a career out, you got you got to work hard. And um, nowadays, it's naturally not necessarily about standing on the range from uh, dawn till dusk and and just grinding and and sort of making your your hands bleed. It's um, it's about you know actually sort of planning your practice, doing the right things, what you need to work on, and and sort of figuring it out like that really. But uh, yeah, I think if they want to make a career out of it, it would be to, to work hard and, and just to, to make sure you keep enjoying it. And happy right. birthday to Jack for tomorrow. Yes, happy birthday. <laughs> One from uh, Bavna, and excuse my pronunciation, I think I've got the right. What's the easiest, or rather, what, what's the easiest major to win, according to you? Uh, I'm not sure there's an answer <laughs> to that, but um, we'll, we'll let, let, let's see what you think. Uh, look, if someone has the answer to that, they could yeah. tell <laughs> if they could hey, let absolutely. me know, that'd be great. <laughs> I'll keep that one to myself. Um, <laughs> no, Probably I mean, anything on an, anything on uh, PlayStation, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think probably possibly the the hardest one to win. Well, no, I would say the probably the most US random. Open. The most random, I would say, would be would be the Open. Um, purely because you could play the golf of your life and have a morning draw on the first day and that could be the worst weather. You shoot one over and that's the leading of, that's the leader of that group. But then in the afternoon it's dead calm and, and everyone's shooting three, four under and you have five shots different. So um, I think that really opens the most random. I would say, I would probably say the, it, it depends who you ask, you know, because if you say to Tiger Woods, what's the easiest to win? He's going to say the Masters all day long. And, and that, you know, he, he, that's that's for him. The hardest for me would be the USPGA. And the same would be for Jordan Spieth, for example. That's the one he's got, they've got to win. And um, th- there isn't an easiest one. I, I, can't, I can't say this is the easiest one to win. <laughs> Just, there terms of, to that one. In terms of open venues, which would be your favourite course my my, fav, my favorite one that i've not actually played would be turnbury uh, i right. really I'd, I'd love it i mean fortunately with the person who owns it now it, yeah. i don't think it's ever going to go back there but yeah um i would love to i'd love to play an open there for sure yeah so we had a couple of questions ahead of ahead of time and and probably a good example i mean you mentioned um the travelers yes but actually the memorial you shot, this is going to sound a bit anoraki, uh, you shot a 75, a 66, a 74, then a 68. And then the following, uh, actually the BMW, you shot 70, 75, then 68, 67. So yeah. the, the thing be, you, you've had a, you know, for you, a bad round. How do you, how do you mentally prepare for the next round 
Honestly, that's a question I'd like to ask everyone else because I can't I can't seem to do that very well at the minute. <laughs> I, uh, I keep I, my my problem is this year, or yeah, my problem sort of the last eighteen months really has just been I've, I've had poor first rounds and that sort of put me out of position. Um, poor first or second round that sort of knocked me back a little bit and stopped me from contending to win. Um, if if I look at the my results where I've played really well or, ha- or not played really well, if I've had really good finishers, um, they tend to be the ones where I've had four good solid rounds. Um, and we're, we, we're trying to sort of, me and my team are trying to sort of work out what, what the reason is really, why I'm, you know, struggling to start off well or or whatever it is. And, and I've always felt that it's one of those for me, once I'm in the position, um, I find it difficult to to give it away to someone. It's I feel like it's my it's mine and I, I hold on to it very well. But um, it's kind of just getting myself more into the contention and and not playing myself out of it too early, really. So um, for me, sort of mentally, I, I'm not really working on anything in particular at the minute. Um, I don't see a psychologist or anything, but um, it, it's just trying to sort of find a balance of not to play myself out of it really when it's when i'm not having a particularly good day yeah yeah and, and just on sorry. Oh, sorry i was just going to say just on that point around sort of the the mental side of the game um there's been you know huge coverage of that over the years from when ernie was working with the likes of joss van Stapoot to the, the the carl morris's and, and the various psychologists that are out there right now um in line with the question from matthew dews what advice would you give to overcome the mental scars of holes or maybe courses you've played poorly in the past? Um, courses that I've played poorly in the past, now we just don't play them again. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, you know, they just get they just get knocked off the schedule. We were shocked off the calendar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, fully, do I think Dubai next year potentially we might not play depending on how the schedule is formed. But um, yeah, we. In terms of golf courses like that, that it's it's a it's a case of, um, you know, every year we sit down and, and look and uh, figure out. We, we tend to play golf courses. Well, we make sure that I play events that I've played well in before. Make sure I play at golf courses I've played well before, and then also just look at what has the best run. So if you know, rather than playing one, then a week off then one again, then a week off. It might be better to play, okay, well, let's play three in a row and then take a week off or two weeks off or whatever it is that, that we kind of make yeah. sure we do that. So um, have a bit, at least can sort of gain some momentum. Um, golf holes, though, what well, I mean, I'm very statistical. Uh, funnily enough, Prativity are helping me with my um, statistics right now. Um, but uh, for me, it'd just be looking at, at the stats on that particular hole, you know, if I've not played it well in particular, you know, why, where am I hitting it? Um, do I need to pick a better line up the tee? Do I need to play more aggressive, less aggressive? Um, purely, purely statistical for, from, from my side of things. Um, I think I got played. So it might have been, it might have been actually here last year. Oh no, maybe it was Wentworth somewhere, somewhere anyway, I got given the scores from my stats team on, my average that I've played certain holes and one of the holes, for example, I was playing it 0.6 over par, which, you know, actually is quite a lot, you know, that's losing effectively. If you play it, if you play it level par for, for four days, you're picking up, uh, what's the mass on that? 0.6. You're picking up yes, two, and a half, two and a half shots on, on, on previous, you know, on, on my, previous scores which is, which is a lot come the end of the week so um for me purely analytical just looking at you know where where i've gone wrong previous years when i've played the golf courses um and yeah and just just sort of taking it from there really and um, what um we've got a, an, an interesting question so i don't think we'll go with uh, who are the overrated players on tour right now but uh, who would you say are, are maybe some of the most underrated players that you see uh, whether that be stateside or, or here on the European tour uh, underrated I, I would say probably Tyrrell Hatton uh, I think Tyrrell I mean he, he's, he's kind of coming out this year I think everyone see that he is he's a very very good player 
Um, but you know, before that, he, he sort of had good runs and, and never really sort of taken off. But this year, he, he's he's played great. Um, really, is a good player, great iron player, so and, and a very good putter. So I think I would say, I would say Tyrrell is probably um, you know my number one. I don't think he gets talked about enough, really. So. And is there anyone you would you dream of having their swing? Apart from maybe Robert Rock, Adam Scott probably, and his yeah. looks. <laughs> um but yeah i would say uh i'd say adam scott you know he, he's got the best swing on tour everyone everyone knows that and uh yeah it's uh he's he's a, he's a great golfer yeah. you know you mentioned you mentioned billy foster your caddy um those on the call who don't know billy um used to uh caddy for seve for lee westwood Darren Clark, and was actually, I think, I read somewhere, voted by the other caddies as the best caddy on tour. So don't take this the wrong way, Matt. Um, how did you end up working with, with Billy? No, no, not all, no. I, so it's a, it's a strange one. I was kind of in limbo at the end of 2018. Um, I just parted with my sort of caddy of two years and... Um, Finding a caddy is basically like picking a new wife or girlfriend, really. That's, that's like you spend more time with them than you do with them. So, um, yeah, th- th- there's a lot of stuff that's got to fit. Um, but I, I'd known Billy a, a while since I came on tour. And, um, you know, obviously I knew about him because of who he was, who he's worked for and stuff. But um, he's close to my coach, who's Mike, and Mike Walker and Pete Cowan, um, you know, he sort of basically put his name in, in the hat for, for my job because, you know, he knew it was going. I was sort of stay, taking my time. Uh, I wanted to make sure whoever it was was going to be the right person. Obviously, I knew that he'd put his name in the hat. Um, there was a few others as well. And and then he worked for me at the end of the year. I was looking for someone um, just to do, to do one week. And uh, he did the week for me. We got on great. Then he came to the end of year meeting and, with the team. And... Um, yeah, he's he's brilliant, very organised, very switched on, goes about his business uh, the the right way, and um, yeah, we you know we get on very well as as people uh, just because of the you know we like football, love golf, obviously, and um, both both from Yorkshire, so it's uh, yeah, it was uh, there was plenty of pluses, and um, yeah, he agreed to work for me. I wasn't going to mention football, but presumably no, no, this has been we, a bit of a challenge on. for we can you. Move on. Yeah, we can move on. <laughs> we'll move on from that. So just for, for those of us who've who've never had a caddy, what what difference does the caddy caddy make? Um, well, you don't have to carry your bag. That's a huge point. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, these bags weigh a ton. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's uh, for me, Billy really brings a lot of things. Um, it was quite interesting. I didn't know this. I mean, I kind of knew it the whole time he's been working for me, but. He's very, he's very, very flat. Very, very flat. Doesn't matter whether winning by ten, losing by ten. He's, he's, he's very flat. So, he told me this after the U.S. Open we, when we just missed the cut. I hold an eight iron on about the fifteenth hole, and, you know, we both just looked at each other. I, I was playing, I, I was playing well, putting awfully. I was disappointed. I wasn't contending. So, like, it went in for a two. I was close to the cut mark. I was like, oh, you know what? All right, whatever. It is, you know, it is what it is. It's great, great. I've held uh, my second shot. He was the exact same. Well, well, well done. A little clap. Nothing nothing too exciting. Anyway, we finished. And then I three put the last to miss by one. And then we get in afterward. And he's, again, he doesn't, you know, no, no motion, nothing, hard luck, whatever. And then we were talking that night. And, uh, he was saying like I was he said I wanted to scream so loud when um you made the two on 15 I was like really that surprised me you never say anything and he, he said and then I wanted to cry when you three put the last on 18 <laughs> I said all right sorry about that sorry about that but no for for me Billy he he, he carries his yardage book so he'll do the yardages he'll walk the golf course he'll tell me the lines off the tee tell me where not to hit it around the greens to, to certain flags. 
Um, what else will he do? Uh, help me, you know, help me in my practice. He'll set up my practice drills, various, various little things like that, really. Um, what about putting, Matt? Will he help with lines, or do you like to do that yourself? No, very rarely. I've I've got to be I've got to be really struggling, really. Uh, if I if I can't see it very well at all, then I'll ask him to come in and have a look. Uh, otherwise, I just uh, I, I tend to do it all myself. So, Matt, today obviously Tuesday, you start first round Thursday. So you've been practicing today. I have, practice yes. Tomorrow, what? Can you just talk us through the sorts of things you do, you know, at, at, for a for a tournament week like this? Yeah, sure. So um, for me, um, I'll normally well, take I'll give you a run through of today. So today, got up this morning, um, shower, go for breakfast, have breakfast, then I go into the gym to warm up for ten minutes, um, stretch foam roller, all these other little little exercises my trainer gives me. Um, and then after that, I met my putting coach. Um, so I saw him for an hour. We did some work on my stroke, hit a few putts as well, sort of did a little test. Uh, then I went from there to the range, hit balls for an hour, just sort of going through my swing. My coach was watching uh just figuring things out oh uh, well not well not there was anything to figure out we just he was just sort of keeping an eye on on where where i'm at really uh and then from there went to play nine holes played the front nine got to see the golf course you know play some chips and putts around the greens think where the flags are going to be okay it's here can't miss it there do it and and sort of all that sort of stuff uh then came back in had some lunch and then I have a uh, flight scope, which is like a radar um, and that tracks how far the ball goes. Um, and I can do different challenges on that. You know, it tells me, OK, hit this one 150 yards, hit this one 167, hit this one 162. And so it's just, you know, it's sort of, um, it sort of like it's a copy of, of, of being on the golf course effectively. Um, but, you, but you're just on the range. So. Uh, I have a couple of those. I did a couple of those challenges, and and then uh, and then that was it. Came back, uh, worked out with my trainer, um, and then I'm here. So um, yeah, that's sort of how it, how it tends to go every day. Um, my performance coach, he co- he plans my days for me. Um, we'll talk about it. What it's it'll normally during tournaments weeks, it'll be relevant to what I'll need for the golf course this week. So he knows that there's a lot of mid irons this week. The day I, I practice mid irons, tomorrow will be the same. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then just to get ready for Thursday. And do you have an idea of where pins are going to be on the course during the week? Or uh, we, I think from from last year we might be able to sort of to get some details from that. Right. Um, but I mean, normally we play the golf course, the golf courses multiple times. So they're always in roughly the same spots to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Will they put dots on there? Will they put dots on the green these days, Matt, or not? They don't do on practice days. They, they, what they do, they do it on um, Thursday, Friday. Well, they do, yeah. So Thursday for Friday, Friday for Saturday. Yeah. yeah. So that's normally what they do. And so then, mentioned- and we've got, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, we've got a question here which feeds in really nicely, actually, um, thinking about strategy. Um, Andrew Law wanted uh, about strategy match play compared to stroke play, but maybe we could link that into your strategy for this week uh, and, and how you're going to attack the tournament. Uh, I mean... I wouldn't say that in match play or stroke play, I wouldn't really say there's there's much difference, particularly now I've seen it at the the pro level. Um, I've played in a couple couple matches uh, or match plays, should I say. Um, and for me, I mean, it's all about keeping yourself in the tournament. Um, the match play side of it is very different, depends who you play. 
it, it's it's a, it really is a completely different game as professional compared to the amateur stuff. You might go out there with a bit more of a of a game plan, whereas as a pro, it's literally just try and make as many birdies as you can and and go with it. You know, you can play aggressive; it doesn't really matter. Stroke play is it's about whoever makes the least mistakes. You know, it really is. Um, I would say the majority of the time, I don't know, I don't have a, a statistic on this, but I would say, um, you know, the people who make the least bogeys for the week, least bogeys and doubles, tend to be the ones that, that have the best weeks. Um, so it's it's not always, a, you know, I would say if you are, if I would say, I mean, people can probably answer at home. You know, I, I don't know. I feel like a lot of amateurs feel like pros go at every flag you know, on, on the golf course. And actually, I would say I go a flag twice, once around, if I'm lucky, I would say. Um, just because, you know, it's just natural. It's, go- it's golf. It's just the way dispersion is of, of golf shots. It's, um, you know, when, when you're on, your dispersion's tied there, but it's not it's not arrow straight every shot. It's just the way it is, so... Um, it's just it's, with the, it's a lot about playing the percentages really. So Matt, you mentioned the U.S. Open, uh, and obviously we've had a few questions about the uh, Bryson and uh, bulking up and his um, bomb and gouge approach. What's yeah. uh, what's? And I, I think he retweeted something. Was it that Lee Westwood had said about how many? Yeah, I did because I, I I was disappointed with the the, the setup. I thought the setup was going to be good, but the, almost the rough wasn't thick enough. Um, to be honest, it, it wasn't penal enough for, for missing. It was pe- don't get me wrong, it was penal, but I don't know. I, I drove the ball fantastically well that week, um, and I didn't really miss many fairways. But I was still going in with, you know, let's say on average it was like a six iron, whereas Bryson was going in with a nine iron for example but he was from the rough well law of averages realistically is is basically makes it as easy with a nine nine out the rough as it does with a six iron from the fairway um i I think the setup was probably they got it a little bit wrong because they didn't make the greens firm enough early doors um and i don't know if that was the time of year or, or what really but the first day that I watched some of the morning golf and guys are hitting it out of the rough and stopping it on the greens and and that's that just isn't a regular U.S. Open um, that really isn't and and it was a bit disappointing disappointing for me because I felt like I had a chance because I thought okay well, this week's going to be a premium on accuracy um, as opposed to to length and and it turns out you know it, it wasn't really um, I didn't get a full look at the full leaderboard but. Certainly the top two, um, two guys that absolutely bomb it, so Wolf and, and Bryson. So uh, hopefully that's not the way the game's going, but, um, you know, it, 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 it might be. And what do you think they'll do? I mean, that, there's so much speculation as to what needs to happen because there is a limit as to how long you can make a golf course, isn't there? Well, I think there's there's that, and, and people are talking about climate change now, and and you know land available to people, and you can't keep making golf courses eight thousand long, eight thousand yards long. You just you just can't. You don't have the room for it. So something's got to be done. Whether equipment change, ball change. Honestly, I I, I don't know. I, I really don't know. There's there's a lot of talk and nothing's been done. So it's. Uh, yeah, it's just going to be very interesting, I think, and um, yeah, we'll have to see what happens. Yeah, but I think just to put it in context, I think your average is around two ninety four off the tee, isn't it, or something? Which yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's so. something I can't even possibly imagine. So, uh, <laughs> so we'll, we'll move on. We'll how, move on. how much of that is carry, though, Matt? Just out of interest. Well, how much of that two ninety four would be carry? I think average. Um, Average tour roll is about 15 yards, so I would guess about 280 ish, 270, 275. And we did have a question. I was just going to go back to the. Uh, I was going back to go, go, go to the question, but the one thing I was going to ask, um, you know, we talk about people bulking up. You've clearly been doing a lot in gym and 
little further if you look at your stats now versus when you first came on tour, you, you see, you know, you're sending it out there a lot further. How have you seen that? And apologies to go a bit anoraki, but in terms of spin rates on your driver and thinking about carries and carry versus roll, how how is that sort of playing out and what, what's the approach do you think moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I again, I, I'm not really, um, I'm not very anal about that sort of stuff, looking for spin rates and I'll keep an eye on it. But I, my drive, as long as my driver goes straight, that's all I'm all I'm bothered about really. So um yeah. i know guys get really into that uh, and i think there's i think there's a limit yeah. i think you, you know you do need to look at it you need to get something that fits your eye and and sort of um that works well and, and you sort of get in get in the distance you want out of it but at the same time i think there's a lot of guys that try and go for um <clears throat> too much distance last control you know they take it out there yeah. and i'm sure you won't mind me mentioning but i played at burnt beesberger in dubai and uh, the first day, and they'd just been doing some driver testing, and this thing, this thing was just falling out of the sky. And when he got one, and it went in the fairway, it was going miles, but he barely hit any fairways. And then the second day he came out, you could see that he fixed the driver. He got more spin on it, and it, he drove it way better. And I think, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of guys that sort of chase distance a bit too much, and and sort of sometimes. Uh, Sometimes end up getting the uh, yeah, sort of the what's the word, the bad end of it, I guess. Mm. So the Masters is going to be in November. Yes. What? I mean, what difference do you think that's going to make compared to? I've I've heard mix. I've heard a mix of things. I've heard it can be very firm and fast at that time of year. Um, that's that's their autumn, so I think it can get quite dry. Um, just before just before the winter there so um i've definitely heard mixed things i've heard that um it could either be dry firm and fast or it could just be cold and wet so um it, it's going to be i think it's going to be cold either way um but uh, i was going to say i'm assuming we've provided you with some productivity um thermals as well as t-shirts uh, of course yeah i'll be i'll be fully wrapped up I'll be fully wrapped for, this, up. for this week as well it looks as a bit, well yeah let me tell yeah. you i've got plenty this week yeah it looks, it looks um, a bit but yeah i mean it's going to be interesting to see see what it's like i mean um yeah I, i've seen pictures and it's it's yellow right now but that's just because the, the summer grass is still still there i think before it uh before it sort of starts growing again yeah. So we've got a couple of questions, Lindsay. Uh, yeah. Just I'm conscious of time, uh, and uh, we want to try and get through everybody's questions. So a couple of a uh, couple of individuals, Matt, have asked around uh, who who would you have wished to have played with, or who do you wish you would have played with that maybe isn't playing now. And then we've got a couple of questions around Ryder Cup uh, partners. So maybe we could link those two together. So who do you wish that you played with that that you hadn't? And um, thinking about you playing in a Ryder Cup, who would you like to partner with? Uh, who I, don't, I wish I'd played with uh, Jack Nicholas in his prime, definitely. Uh, Lee Trevino as well, um, just because the, the way he had a sort of quite an interesting technique. Um, and then Ryder Cup partners. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to play with, with Rory. Um, I think that I think that'd be good. Um, being lucky enough to play with Henrik Stenson in in the the one that I did play. Um, but yeah, so sort of, I, I yeah, I think it'd be it'd be good to play with Rory. Really, I think uh, he can sort of just knock it on all the greens, and I'll just hold the putts. So that'll be uh, that'll be fine. <laughs> and the right decision to cancel <laughs> sounds like a good postpone it. Yeah. Yes, I, I would say it was the right decision. Um, I would say it was, you know, no crowds. It was never, never going to be the same atmosphere. And, and next year, hopefully, crowds will be allowed back, and uh, and it'll be great. Cool. So, a few quick fire questions, if that's all right, Matt. Sure. Um, favorite course on the European Tour? Uh, Kransas, yeah. Has to be, doesn't it? Yeah. No. No. No doubt. No yeah. Doubt. I could. <laughs> It is the one I look at on the TV and think, I wish I could play that course. Yeah. But, um, uh, lowest score for 18 holes? 
60. Whereabouts? Uh, that was in Holland, actually. It's a uh, Kenemere golf course, I think. Holes in one? Three. Most recently? Uh, three years ago, I think. On on tour? In, uh, no, in, in New York, actually, in New York. Just playing with a friend. Choice between the Open and the Masters? Uh, the Masters, yeah. Really? Yeah, you get to go back every year. Part of that. There's just, I don't know, there's something about it. I just, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Have you ever scored double figures on a hole? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. I can't remember it. Maybe as a kid, but not, not as a pro or as an amateur. And what do you do away from golf to, um, to relax? Uh, try to go on holiday when I can uh, but uh, no I mean regular weeks just you know watch football not that it's very relaxing at the minute um, and, and sort of you know catch up with my mates and, and family really it's not uh, it's not a lot I'm not, I don't, I'm not really a partier so uh, yeah we've got a question in the chat how do you men- mentally recover from a bad shot now, this is advice I need. Cause... Yeah, it's advice I need as well, to be honest. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, uh, for, for me, the, the my coach told me something good the other day, but I've completely forgot it, which is really, really bad. But it's something, it's something like, you know, you can't do anything about the last shot. It's literally the shot. You, the, the most important, the mo- most important, oh, that's it. Most important shot in golf is the next one. Yeah. So, you know, the le- and the least important is the one that's just been hit. So, um, you know, you can't do anything about it. you just got to get on with it. As frustrating yeah, as it can be, it's, uh, you just got to get on with it. And I think that's the difference between pros and amateurs. The pros, it's the next shot after a bad one is always yeah. a good recovery it's shot. a good one, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Matt, um, Matt if, you get, if you hit a bad of- shot... Are you a club thrower? Are you a club no. thrower, a breaker, tantrum, or not? No, not a, not a club, not a club thrower or a breaker. Just you know, just get frustrated myself. So we've got an, a lot of. I mean, apart from Dave, we've got a lot of amateurs here. We've had a few questions which I won't ask. Things like you know, I occasionally slice it off the off the tee. How do I stop? How do I fix um, it? Yeah. So, but I guess. What's the one piece of advice when you see amateurs play? What's the one thing that you think, as a as a as a group, we ought to focus on? Everyone tries to swing out the shoes. Yeah, everyone tries to swing it way too hard, and I think it. it everyone, yeah, for me, it would just be to slow it down. Um, you know, certainly on the way back, slow it down on the way back, and you know, keep it slow on the way through. Too many people are just. I don't know if it's excitement, nerves, or what. They just try to just take the skin off the ball. You're our brand ambassador. What was it that you uh, saw in Prativity that uh, made you choose us? Yeah, for me, it was um, – I'd met Joe. My manager, Ted, had done done a lot of talking to, to Joe, your, your CEO. Um, and, you know, sort of they were very – or. Joe was telling me about the, you know, the very innovative, um, you know, the fact that you're global officers all over the world. So it sort of speaks with me, um, given all the traveling that I do. Um, obviously, Joe very much into into his golf too, and so we talked a lot about that. But um, you know, the, the fact was for me that particularly at the start, I felt that you know we could work together. Um, and do sort of some projects that actually we kind of both care about really, as opposed to sort of just going through the motions. Um, And that's one thing that uh, I mentioned earlier about Prativity sort of helping me, the data team's actually helping me with my stats right now, trying to build me something to help me analyze it a little bit better. Um, And that's, you know, that, that that's huge for me. It's going to be huge for me, hopefully for, for that, for, Activity as well I can sort of help almost advertise that and, and sort of show it off really um, so it, it's it, it felt like a, a great match and um, came at the right time for me 
and uh, no, I mean, so far it's been it's been brilliant. Um, we've I've had have had a great time, done done a lot of stuff with the uh, with the company, and hopefully so it'll be great going forward. So we've got one comment in the chat. I don't think it's a question. Okay. It's from an, a former colleague of mine, uh, Niall Simpson, who's actually in the Cayman Islands. So we'll 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 not, we'll not feel too sorry for him. He says, "How did you hit a ball 294 yards by slowing down your swing?" Question mark. Question mark. Yeah. I just park that. Slowing down on the way back, point. you can accelerate you as much as you want on the way through. <laughs> So, Matt, very conscious of time. This has been a real lot of fun for, for certainly for Dave and me. We really appreciate uh, you joining really us no today. Worries. We are properly proud uh-huh. to have you representing us uh, on and off the course. We wish you all the very best for thank this week, for much. next week, for the season ahead. I want to thank everyone else for, for joining us and for all the questions. Play well, stay safe and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you for listening today. To learn more about Matt and LPGA Tour member Jennifer Cupcho, who also is a Pertivity brand ambassador, visit pertivity.com slash golf. I also invite you to subscribe to our Powerful Insights podcast series wherever you find your podcast content.